But most of all, he's a very positive, very incredible person. He wants to talk to you just about a little bit of everything. We talk about positive attitude. The man has it. He had it when he came to town. We'll talk a little bit about that too, along with writing the big hits. Uh, a few awards he's won. Uh, BMI awards. Let's see. I do what. Let's talk about some of his twenty-some cuts. You may have heard of a few of them. Uh, the man had top five Pan Pillars. Do you know where your man is? Number one single, Confederate Railroad, Queen of Memphis. Uh, cuts by Matt Keane, Tanya Tucker, Marie Osmond, Larry Boone. One of my all-time favorite songs, Joe Diffie's Ships That Don't Come In. Montgomery Gentry, Lonely and Gone, House on the Corner of Lonely and Gone. Tammy Wynette, couple Steve Warner, top fives, number ones. James House, Daisy Dern, Alabama. Anybody ever heard the song Jukebox in My Mind? That man wrote it. Uh, Steve Warner, Midnight Fire, Steve Warner, Don't Give Up On Love. A couple, Southern Pacific, I Was Lost, Honey, I Dare You, Conway Twitty, House on the Old Lonesome Road. With Bernie Nelson. Bernie. With Bernie Nelson in the house. Where's Bernie back there? Uh, Conway Twitty cut, that's cool. That lonely word has worked for you, Dave. Uh, Confederate Road, Railroad, Daddy Never Was, a Cadillac Town. Yeah. Uh, incredible awards. Bernie Nelson's, yeah. Uh, Gibson Miller Band won, a, won the uh, Academy of Country Music Award, 1993 Top New Vocal Duo or Group. And uh, let's just say, come on up here, Dave. Yeah. How did you do all that stuff? That's a good question, though. <laughs> Some people call me the luckiest man in show business. Um, I was here about, I guess, a little less than a year, and um, I was able to have a top five song in about a year and a half. So uh, one of my buddies, riding buddies, said, man, you're the luckiest man in show business. Nobody does that. So I, I was at the right place at the right time with the right song. and. Uh, I'm glad all you folks could come to me. But that didn't just happen with the first song you wrote, did it? Actually, uh, I just figured this out the other day. I was talking to somebody, and they asked me about the first song I ever wrote. Actually, the first song I ever wrote by myself. And, uh, and I said, well, oh, that must have been, you know, just some little ditty or something. <laughs> I said, you know, Actually, the first song I ever wrote by myself got recorded by Reba McIntyre. <laughs> it didn't make the album, but that's okay. You know, I got another one down the road. Yeah, that's awesome. But um, let's talk a little bit about that. What'd you do before you came? I mean, I don't think you just decided to write a song, come to Nashville, things are going to happen. How did you prepare for all of that? Well, you know, I, I started writing songs. Uh, when I was about 25, 26 years old, and uh, oh man, no, I was like 15. <laughs> As I recall, no, I, I, uh, I played folk music when I was a kid, and uh, started writing, uh, writing. I mean, started playing the guitar when I was about 12, 13 years old, and um, had some folk trios in high school, and then went to college. And you believe that? I went to and had a band in college, and, um, and always loved music, but I thought I wanted to be a commercial artist. Uh, I really loved art, and, and thought maybe uh, you know, that'd be a good profession for me, <clears throat> since my most of my family told me that you know being a musician, especially my dad, was you know was like he <laughs> ain't gonna go nowhere doing that, son. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get that sheepskin on the wall. <laughs> That's what we call it a diploma, you know. <laughs> so I did that, but you know, I, you know, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't really do anything else but music, really, the, all my life. I, I did teach school for about three years. After I graduated from college, I moved to uh, Chicago, and, uh, and that's a whole other story, but uh, a whole other life. And, uh, um, actually, started playing music up there. Have you, have you ever been to Chicago? A little, a couple of times. Yeah, well, it's, it's a great town, it really is. It frees your ass off in the wintertime <laughs> and, uh, and uh, die in the summer, but uh, it's really a great music town. And, and uh, <clears throat> back in the 
70s, and uh, anyway, I'm, I'm kind of proud of my heritage, so I'll tell you. Back in the 70s, the folk beat scene was really happening with uh, John Prine and Steve Goodman. I'm sure you know, know, Yo. you know who those people are. <laughs> Some of my favorite, uh, uh, I know that guy back there. <laughs> Um, some of my favorite people, and Josh Leo, I met Josh Leo in Chicago back in the 70s. Um, and uh, moved up there and, and just had, a, had 11 years of, uh, you know, a good time. I had a band. We played one place for five years, another place for two and a half years, and uh, we were the house band backing up people like Steve Warner and, and Merle Kilgore. Uh, uh, everybody, uh, Dean Dillon, I mean, we backed them all up. <laughs> How did that prepare you for coming up here? When was the time for you to come here? What did you know? When I got divorced. <laughs> 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 club scene and everything and kind of died away in Chicago. The urban cowboy craze went away. And I said, you know something? Uh, uh, in spite of what people tell me about, oh, it's too tough down there, I said, I don't give a damn what it is. <laughs> so I'm going to Nashville. And uh, so I packed up my old Ford van and uh, my guitars and a few, few clothes and, and I came to Nashville. And uh, that was 1982. And I was very lucky to to well, I slept on the street for a couple of years, a couple of weeks, not years, <laughs> in my van. <laughs> Finally, an uh, old buddy of mine uh, sent me a couple of thousand dollars to get me started. And got me a, an apartment and everything, and, and uh, that's how I started. Started playing some of the clubs around, you know. And uh, then I got to met a guy named Tony Brown, who changed my life, changed my, uh, my whole uh, career. <clears throat> Took me in the studio, he and Nora Wilson. Uh, back in 1982, and, and uh, tried to get me a deal at RCA, and they were both there at the time, doing a and r And uh, he couldn't get me a deal at the time, and he said, you gotta write, you gotta write me a song for Steve Warner, because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, working with Steve, and Joe Galani just thinks you kind of sound like Steve. And he was all, it's like, you don't sound like Steve at all. <laughs> but anyway, I said, okay, so I had this idea called Midnight Fire, and I had a little, you know, guitar uh, idea on it. And I went out and met this guy, Lewis Anderson, who Tony introduced me to. And Lewis and I, in about two hours, wrote this song. And uh, I don't mean to take all the time here. But anyway, I was just telling y'all. And in about two hours, we uh, we came up with this song. Uh, and it was the coolest thing that you know I've been a part of. I'd never co-written with anybody ever, you know, just nobody in Chicago. And um, <clears throat> so we came up with this uh, with this song, and and I just ran it down to Tony and uh, said, "Man, we wrote this song. I think, I think you might like it. Steve might like it." So he heard it. I had it on a little cassette player, and you know, he said, "Man, this is cool." He said, Played it for Steve and. So, make a long story short, in about two or three months' time, I um, wrote the song. It was uh, picked as the title of the album and the first single. And I was like, <laughs> the luckiest man in show business. <laughs> <laughs> I think most important to be prepared. You've been playing all of those years. You came up here, you knew how to write, you studied, you networked. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, Something we've talked about uh, several times over the years is your attitude. That means everything. <laughs> everything. Yeah, talk a little bit about that, you know, the notes and so forth. Yeah, well, you know, uh, Tony really liked my voice back then. and He wanted to make it happen for me as an artist, but it just didn't happen at the time. And uh, he said, do you mind? Because I had another song that he'd cut on me that I'd written by myself. <clears throat> Uh, he said, do you mind if I use this track on Steve Warner's, uh, on the album? And I said, are you kidding me? And so I had two songs on that first album. Uh, a song called Don't You Give Up On Love. I, I noticed you mentioned it a while ago. Uh, so I could have said, no, man, I want to keep that for myself. But he used the track that he cut on me for Steve. And it's like, 
<laughs> how can I lose, you know? And, uh, you know, some people think at the time, oh, well, I'm going to be an artist, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. The best thing in the world you can do is get your song cut by somebody who's happening. And uh, Steve Warner was one of my heroes, you know. I, it was like a dream come true to get, get that song cut by him. So, anyway, attitude is everything. I, uh, uh, I worked my ass off. I really did, writing sometimes two and three times a day um, with different writers. And it, it just, it all paid off after all those years. And uh, anyway, attitude is the best. But did you write notes and put them all over your bathroom or something? Your kids I did. You were nuts, something. That, that, that just, <clears> I did. I did. Think you remember that. I do. You remember that. I did the same thing. I, I, I'm telling you, uh, I read this book because I was, you know, I had another life and, and, and I had to get over some things that, that I was guilty about, you know, and, and I read this book called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. The guy is like, you know, he's a guru. And uh, so I read, this, I read this book and I started putting these notes on my, on my, my mirror and in my car, every, everywhere you can imagine, you know, uh, just pumping myself up. I'm going to have this, I'm going to have this. And I put exactly what I was going to have on it. You know, I was going to have a number one song by such and such date. And I was very, very, very specific about what I wanted, you know. And uh, because I read his book, I said, yeah, I don't want to do this, man. I'm, this is my, my work. And, and, it, and it changed my whole way of thinking, you know. I just, I was, every time I'd get a, a negative thought in my head, you know, it would go away. And this was before anything ever happened. By the way, <clears throat> uh, I just want to interject this thing. Um, one of my best friends in the world is Wynn Varble, and, and he and I were broke at the same time. <laughs> I mean, we were broke, real broke. <laughs> uh, we met at some little bar over on Nolensville Road, and, and uh, Wynn had won the contest, or oh, they had a contest. This is back in 82, 83, well, 82, before anything ever happened for me. And <laughs> he said, yeah, I won this contest, man. I won, I won 100 bucks. And, and we were both so broke. And I said, yeah, you know, 100 bucks, a couple of nights. So I go, <laughs> and he said, you got to sing one of your songs. He said, you win some money. So I'll go over there, <laughs> and, he and, I, he and I are both on the thing. And he says, I don't know you're going to win. Well, I did win. But that night, they were giving away strings and picks. <laughs> I said, what the hell am I going to do with this? I need some money. <laughs> so, I got some up from you. I tried to sell them on the way out. <laughs> but anyway, I just want to tell you all that. That was, a, that was a fun time. I don't even know where I was in my conversation. Oh, you helped me out. <laughs> no, it's the importance of friends. You know, the, the second the second rule of thinking grow rich is your mastermind alliance. Let's talk a little bit about that. Your friends on the journey, how they help you. I mean, that's one example. Yeah. But have, have you seen that help you? You put together your group that you really work together. Well, I actually helped win a whole lot one night. We've been drinking some moonshine, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we got up in the morning. At least I got up in the morning because I had drunk quite as much as he had. And he said, you got a gun? And I said, no, man, I don't have a gun. He said, well, if you have one, you can shoot me. <laughs> so I actually helped him out by not shooting him. And, and I got his butt back to town after he moved, moved to uh, West Palm Beach and married this girl from, you know, there in Europe. Anyway, he, uh, he came back to town, and uh, he's done pretty well for himself. Yeah. He has the that's the importance of friends on my journey when that's what's going on. <laughs> Let's move on. So you had that. You read a couple number one. Let's talk about the connection to Alabama. How does things like that happen for a writer to end up some of the, the bigger success? Um, actually, uh, I got to write for the, the two biggest quartets in, in country music history. My first uh, publishing deal was with uh, Silvermine Music which was the uh, Oak Ridge Boys Company, and Tony Brown and <clears throat> was actually a writer at that time with uh, uh, Silverline or Goldline. And um, uh, those guys, you know, I, I had that hit, and I brought her in to the company, uh, Midnight Fire. And, uh, of course, Tony, you know, he, he, 
he introduced me to everybody in the world, and I had a chance to go other places, but I, um, I went to uh, the Oak Ridge Boys Company, and uh, and then I went to ride for the other four biggest guys who won all the awards all those years. Four, you know, <laughs> always felt sorry for the the Oaks. You know, they never quite get up there and got them damn awards like like Alabama did. But hey, they're doing they did real well right now. I mean, they're they're making a whole lot of money still. And um, anyway, uh, I wrote after I, I left. The Oakridge Boys Company. I, I went and, and uh, started writing for Maypop Music, uh, which was Alabama's company, and uh, that's where uh, uh, in, in my third year there, actually, is when everything happened. Um, I had this idea, uh, and I wrote it down on a piece of paper, and I had a, had a melody in my head, and I said, "Yeah, this, is, this sounds like I've never heard this before, and it might be kind of cool." So. I went next door, and um, my buddy Ronnie Rogers was right in there, and he had written a bunch of hits, Dixieland Delight, and a bunch more for Alabama. And I said, hey, Ronnie, what do you think of this idea? And I, and I sang it to him, and he said, oh, my God. He said, I love that. So in about two hours, we sit down and write this song that uh, ended up being Alabama's biggest hit they ever had at radio. Which, well, I didn't know that until Red Bull a few months ago. Uh, it was four weeks at number one. And the most country thing they ever did, and, and the little funny story about that, is Ronnie and I wrote this song, and the next day we were supposed to ride with Teddy Gentry, the bass player. And Teddy was about two hours late getting to the writing session because his big white Mercedes broke down on it. <laughs> and I, he got there and he said, what you boys been working on, you know, and, and we've been working a little, tweaking a little bit on uh, Jukebox in my mind, and we played the song and he said, oh my God, he said, that's going to be our next single, that's it, Alabama's doing, that's, that's it, and we're like, what the hell is he talking about, <laughs> there's no way that Alabama's going to cut anything in this country. Well, it just so happens that timing is everything. They were looking for a song that was country because the DJs and everybody out there at radio had been telling Randy that they, they weren't country. They, you know, they'd gone away from the, the genre that they had gone into more southern rock, pop kind of thing. So Randy, I mean, he was mad. I mean, he was pissed. <laughs> so <laughs> Teddy heard this song and he, and he grabs it, you know, he takes it out to Randy, and Randy's in a song, and Teddy just told me the story, because I didn't know this whole thing. Takes it out to Randy's house, and Randy's in the song, as he's waiting for him until he gets out. <laughs> he gets out, and he says, Randy says, what the hell are you doing here? And he says, well, I just brought you a hit song. And he, he says, you want to hear it? And he says, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, I, I'd be a fool to turn a hit song down. So, after he heard it, and Teddy said, well, what do you think? He says, yeah, I'd be a fool to turn a hit song down. <laughs> so that's how that happened. Where did that idea come uh, I don't know. Somewhere in my demented brain, it, it just popped into my head one day, and the melody, and it's like a gift. You know, box in my mind was in your mind. <laughs> yeah, somewhere, somewhere back there. So you had to uh, start having that success. Do you have any dry years? Uh, things not going on, and what keeps uh, you going? Oh yeah, what keeps you going? <laughs> going on? I've had a few dry years. Uh, yeah, I have. Um, well, after all the success as a writer that I had, um, I was very lucky to uh, meet uh, a guy named Blue Miller through Doug Johnson, who uh, introduced us, and <clears throat> and Blue and I started writing songs and Doug said if you put a band together, I love these songs you're writing, if you put a band together, I'll, I'll get you a deal. And about that time, time is everything, he he uh, he got the deal at uh, as AR at Epic. And he told them that he wanted to bring us in over there as the first act. <coughs> so we went in and cut five songs on uh, on a demo And uh, we cut the hell out of them. We, we cut uh, some big hits. You know, that ended up on our first album. <clears throat> and um, so, I don't know where I was going with all that. Uh, <laughs> it's the Gelsey Miller band. I mean, it's 
<laughs> well, it gets the middle of band. How does that happen? I mean, Somebody well, likes you, thinks the world of you, you're networking. It, it, was, uh, it was pretty amazing um, for all that to happen after all the years of trying to do different things as an artist. <clears throat> but always, always, um, when I got my record deal, my attorney told me, he says, if you don't write a song every day, I'm going to kick your pants. He says, you've got to write because the bones of many a wannabe artist, uh, songwriter, are littered all over Music Row. <laughs> and so I kept on writing, kept on writing. But you know how things go. You know, you got to get a record deal, and all of a sudden, you know, we had a lot of success. Don't get yeah. wrong, I love all that success. And we, I doubled up on my career and all that. But the end product <clears throat> is the song. And that is your retirement. That is, is what makes you, uh, you know, gives you the, the whatever it is Nashville wants. And if you have one hit, I mean, it'll carry you. So keep rocking. <laughs> Where do you get that idea and put it all together? Oh, it's all mine. Pictures. It's all mine. It's all your idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is Paul Nelson here tonight? <laughs> I wrote about it. Paul is a, a good friend, um, great songwriter. Uh, we were getting together one time. Uh, we were writing at Maypop at the time. Um, and uh, we were writing this other song. It was some little ditty. I can't, can't remember what it was. And, and I said, Paul, I said, I'm not into this song. I said, I know you got, I know you got another idea in there. I, I, you know, you were already part of the 18 Wheels and the Dustin Roses. I know that you got another one of those in your, in your little book there. So he reluctantly opened the book, <laughs> pulled out this idea, ships that don't come in. I said, ships that don't come in. I said, oh my God, that's, that's great. I, I love that idea. So I just, actually started playing this melody and this melody just came out of nowhere or whatever and we wrote that song in probably three or four hours that day and, and both of us after it was over said <clears throat> and this song probably not, not ever going to get cut because it got two cuss words one that's never been used in a song <laughs> yeah well hell a bitch you know <laughs> so it was like Okay, maybe not, but I know I love this song. We both love it, and uh, that song hung around for a couple of years. Alabama took it in the studio, did not cut it. And uh, Bob Montgomery found it on a tape, um, tapes back then. And it was just, you know, by chance, found this song, and he took it to Joe, and Joe didn't like it. He didn't want to sing it. He said, just sing it one time for me in the studio. He said, just go and sing it one time. And Joe went in there, I was, okay, I'll do it reluctantly. Walked out of the, the vocal booth. He says, oh my God. He says, yeah. <laughs> this song is, I mean, it, it just touched him. It really did. And uh, we were very fortunate for that song about the th same time that we had the Gibson Miller band happening uh, Ships That Don't Come In went to number one in spite of one of the biggest stations in the country not playing it because it had a bitch <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean that's a great story it was around everybody passed on it the artist didn't want to yeah no, that's that's somebody you got to find somebody to believe in your songs don't you absolutely Absolutely. You got a great, you know, the songs are, are, are timeless. I mean, I, I never will forget the story about hearing uh, Chris Christopherson know to help me make it through the night, 10 years before Sammy Smith ever cut it. And that was his first hit. So, you know, and there's many, many stories like that. You've seen a lot of people in the last almost 20, 30 years. <clears throat> You've seen a lot of people that were didn't have anything going to have a success. 
Anything come to mind with all those stories? On yeah. Someone? <laughs> one of the biggest ones is Don Schlitz. I guess you folks know who Don Schlitz is. He didn't have anything going for 10, 5, I don't know how many years. I mean, he was here way before I was. And one night, you know, just... <laughs> Um, I remember the story about him, um, his co-writer that he started the song with. I can't remember his name right now. Better let me, you know, better not say who it was. <laughs> but Garth called him up in the middle of the night. He said, "Hey, we got to finish the song. I, I'm on it. I'm on it." And he said, "Man, you finish it. I can't get up." Well, it turned out to be the gambler. And. <laughs> <laughs> that just that just goes to show you that your your stick to itness is the most important thing that you can do. Even if you're hungover, even if you're tired, go to that damn writing appointment. I've done it before. I I, I have, and I've, I've come out with a hit. Paul Overstreet <clears throat> told me about how he hung over he was way back when when he was drinking a lot and doing a lot more stuff. He said, you know. Uh, he went and uh, he actually was writing with Don that day. You know, and they, they wrote, uh, I think it was, uh, 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 for the biggest songs. Uh, Randy Travis. Yeah, on the other, I think it was on the other hand. And he said, Yeah, you know, I'm glad you're glad I got out of bed that day. <laughs> <laughs> so you just never know. You never know when the magic is going to strike. Another one of my favorites is The House on the Corner, which helped catapult Montgomery Gentry. Talk that, a little bit about that. That song is uh, uh, one, one of the, of course, Greg Crow and Bill McCorby, they're, they're not here, so I wrote that one by myself. <laughs> uh, Greg uh, had this little guitar rift, and um, I really like that riff, Bill. I said, yeah, man, that's pretty cool. It had a little feel to it. And um, we actually started that song uh, and wrote it from the top down. I had no idea where we were going with it. Just started with a guitar riff. I've done that on a couple other hits. And it just, the music was moving us that day. And uh, Bill came up with the first line, or I think I came up with the second line. Uh, Pulled in the driveway, picked up the paper, found my key and I locked the door and stuff. Anyway, <clears throat> got to the chorus, we didn't have we didn't have a hook. We wrote the chorus <laughs> to know <a> hook. <laughs> oh my God, what the hell are we gonna do now? <laughs> so all of a sudden this popped into my head. Uh, I mean, thank thank you, Lord. I've been I don't know where it came from, but it, it just fit it fit everything. And that's a lot of times the energy will happen like that. Something you know, the right line will, will come on you, and it's like, man, just like, yeah, you. <laughs> just like somebody laying hands on you, you know, the, the energy's there, and you're, you're just channeling this, this, this great stuff, you know. That's how that happened. No, uh, no specific idea, we just wrote it from a guitar bag. So how did Montgomery Gentry hear that? What did you do? <clears throat> um, <laughs> you know, that, that, there's many stories around that. Uh, <laughs> What's your story, Dave? Uh, well, you know, Ellen, recorded Ellen out here is one of the people who got that song to Montgomery Gentry. Where are you, Ellen? Where are you here? There you are, darling. She's <laughs> yeah, fishing songs, and she is a, an old friend. And um, you know, there's many stories. Whitney Dane was at our company, uh, Fitching Songs. Um, but Anthony Martin over at Sony loved the song, and he actually cut a demo on them. And after we heard the demo, we said, oh my God, <laughs> forget that. <laughs> Sorry, Anthony, it just didn't quite happen. But anyway, he was loved that song and loved it and, and kept it on hold. And my God, it seemed like a year and a half. And, and sure enough, uh, when Jim Cotton and Joe Scave got a hold of that, they cut a, a hit on it. And I was so happy to be on that album because to me that's, you know, just my feelings are that was one of the greatest albums they ever did it was Tattoos and Scars. Oh, yeah. So I'm just happy to be on that album. <laughs> and thank you, Bill. <laughs>
when, when you go into a co-writer, what should a co-writer have? You got this appointment tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Anybody have any co-writes this week, next week? <laughs> What's the best way to prepare for a co-writer? Just drink a lot before you get <laughs> have an open mind and you, know, you don't always have to have an idea like you know I was saying before just sit there and come up with it just talk start talking about stuff that's you know that's on your mind you know something that's on your heart that uh, you never know where an idea is going to come from you know it's, it's the way I my whole philosophy of writing songs is the rules are there ain't no rules <laughs> It's just, you know, whatever turns you on, you know, it might be a guitar riff, it might be something that somebody says. Um, I like to write with a guitar in my hand. Um, sometimes I'll come up with melodies in my head or ideas in my head in the car. The car is a great place because your mind is like, you know, wandering. That's probably why I run off the road. <laughs> At least that's what Daisy tells me. Uh, <laughs> But it, it's best to um, just be open-minded, you know, and, and don't think, oh, you know, because maybe you don't write a hit one day with, with somebody. You may not have the greatest chemistry with somebody. You just never know. But, you know, give it a couple times, and, and you just might come up with something great. Um, attitude, you know, it all comes down to attitude. It really does, and, and being positive. Positive, and, and the stuff that comes out of your mouth, is kind of like out in the universe, you know. If you're negative, you talk about the business negative, and I've done it myself, I still do it, and I have to slap myself, you know, all the time. So, I really don't like that, you know. Well, who cares whether I like it or not, it's out there. You know, somebody's doing something. And you just got to uh, maintain that, uh, uh, that positive energy that, that makes everything happen, you know. You don't... You don't have to just like, oh, well, I love that, you know. You don't have to do that. You just say, no comment or whatever, you know, if you don't like something. Isn't that right? Do you say that's pretty good? You can, yeah. You to make that lot better, but at least they said something yeah. that you're going. Is that what you do? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I try to. Sometimes I go off on a damn thing. You know, break, go break. <laughs> and I have to, you know, forgive myself. Are, are there any people here that only write lyrics? Everybody plays guitar in here? Anybody just write lyrics? Wow. A few? Every time you all these great guitar players in here every day. I just wrote with a guy the other day, Tom Tom Martin. <laughs> Bartender over there. He's a good lyricist. Yeah. But if you just write uh, lyrics or anybody ever have any trouble coming up with ideas for lyrics? Yeah. What do you suggest for this stuff? Yeah. Right? You only write lyrics. Well, tell them what the best thing they need to do if you have Go home. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, Paul Nelson, that's about all Paul has done throughout the years. He does play guitar, but he doesn't he doesn't really take it out unless somebody doesn't play at all. And I mean he's had some pretty damn good success, you know. Um, if if you're a lyricist, you know, I mean, poems are not gonna get it. You know, you gotta write in song form. Um if you don't know what song form is, you really gotta learn what that is, you know, and the rhyme schemes that that work uh, you know with with music. And uh, just you know, listen to songs and, and, and see what the rhyme schemes are and, and how they uh, how they work on the beats and everything. You know. Which you can, you know, if you write with somebody that's a good guitar player or a piano player, then uh, a lot of times they'll kind of take your ideas and, and put them into uh, music, you know. That's kind of like what I was doing with Tom the other day and working with him. And it's like, there's some great ideas here and, and some images, you know, that are really cool. And um, anyway, I was I would suggest that, yeah. I was talking with someone that's been here uh, the last four or five times. So man, I can't find co-writers. How do you go about, <laughs> okay, you're trying to figure this town out, you move, 
moved here six months ago a year, you were just having a challenge getting co rides What's the best way to go about that, Dave? <laughs> hey, man, nice to meet you. We ought to write a song. Or is it get to know somebody and do something besides write? What do you, what do you recommend for somebody like that? Well, just, you know, networking. Um, uh, don't go into writer's nights. You know, just listening to other people. and It's always best to write with somebody that's stronger in one area than you are. Um, or at least on the same level, but it's it's always best to write with somebody who's, who's really got, you know, maybe they had a hit, a hit or something, but that's not always possible. It's, um, uh, you got to have an introduction from somebody else, or they have to hear your song and say something to you. It's not cool to go up to somebody that, you know, that's had a bunch of hits, hey man, it was rough, you know, it was rough. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's just not good etiquette, you know, and usually that's like, yeah, right, <laughs> uh, and, and don't give CDs to people, you know, they don't want them, they'll just toss them in the garbage, you know, <laughs> but I know it's tough, it's it's really tough out there, um, but there's there's a protocol, there's ways of doing it, and I'm not saying that, that there's one way of doing it, you know, uh, but being up there and playing your song and having somebody else say, hey man, I really like the way you ride, or are you listening to somebody uh, singing on stage and saying, I, I, love, I love that song and, and I think you and I, you know, maybe could write, you want to write sometime, you know. That's, that's the best way that I know of, or, or NSAI, you know, NSAI is the greatest place to, to go and, and uh, be a part of the community and, and really, uh, network with people because there's a lot of, of uh, great young songwriters that are, that are coming into Nashville and old songwriters. You know? um, remember Tony Lane? Tony Lane was sitting in a little bar out in Franklin when we were getting the Gibson Miller band together. And you know, I thought he was an old drunk sitting in the, the booth. <laughs> he, he came up one day and he gave me this tape or a CD. I don't know, maybe CD. It was a tape back then. Yeah, well, it probably was, 90, 91. Uh, and